Welcome to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. My name is Paul Brigner. I'm head of U.S. policy and strategic advocacy for the Electric Coin Company. In a few moments, I will be joined by Miller Whitehouse Levine, CEO of the DeFi Education Fund. We believe in fostering a respectful and inclusive environment for our discussions. And while we at Electric Coin Company hold strong opinions on the need for private and confidential financial transactions in crypto to promote economic freedom, our guests may have different views. Through these thought-provoking and at times challenging conversations, we aim to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards the development of pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not legal or financial advice. Our guest remarks may not reflect the views of their organization or electric coin company. Thank you for joining the podcast. We hope you enjoy it. It is my pleasure to welcome Miller Whitehouse Levine, the CEO of the DeFi Education Fund, to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast. With an extensive background in public policy, Miller has dedicated his career to driving innovation and fostering a regulatory environment that supports the growth of the blockchain and DeFi industries. Before joining the DeFi Education Fund, Miller led the Blockchain Association's policy operation, shaping key policy initiatives in the blockchain space. Prior to that, he worked at Goldstein Policy Solutions, where he contributed to the development of a boutique lobbying firm specializing in financial services, telecommunications, and cybersecurity. Miller holds a BS in international politics and a minor in Mandarin Chinese from Georgetown's School of Foreign Service. His unique blend of policy expertise and passion for decentralized finance make him a key figure in the ongoing conversation around DeFi's potential and its regulatory landscape. Miller, thank you for being on the PGP for Crypto podcast. I have to start this conversation by saying that your organization and your work has been truly an inspiration. There are just a handful of organizations that I believe are driving everything that we're doing and certainly things that I believe in. So thank you for all of your work and thank you for being here to share your perspectives with us. Paul, thank you for that overly generous introduction, and thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Well, we have a lot to cover. There has been so much that's happened very recently, and I have to say that I even appreciate you taking the time to be here, uh, taking your My time away, away from your work, because I know it's so important right now. But to get started, could you please just tell us about the mission and goals of the DeFi Education Fund? and how your background in policy and regulation has prepared you to lead the organization. Sure, yeah. So the DeFi Education Fund, we are a relatively new organization in D.C., and our mission is to advocate on behalf of the DeFi ecosystem, users, developers, and the technology itself to to a large extent uh, before policymakers. So we do research, education, and advocacy uh, with the intention of creating a policy environment around the world that is welcoming of uh, decentralized financial infrastructure and decentralized governance, people's ability to code protocols freely, access them freely, uh, because DeFi, uh, we believe strongly, has massive potential to uh, improve the state of the world in a lot of really unique and, I think, uh, important ways. So that is our mission and uh, why we get out of bed every morning, notwithstanding the chaos that is uh, the crypto policy situation, uh, which you were were alluding to there. Um, My background, I think that I've always been personally interested in crypto before I got into it professionally. And so I think that has been a blessing in that... uh, my personal interest and my professional life is uh, in complete, uh, is completely synthesized in a lot of ways. And I think that you know, makes it a joy to, to get up every day and do the work we're doing because it's uh, fun, interesting, and I think really important. Um, I first got into crypto because uh, at the time I was living in China and the expat community in Beijing was interested in this weird thing called Bitcoin. 
uh, which really was the only thing at the time. I think Doge, <laughs> Doge was was in the headlines, but it was really Bitcoin. And the contrast of a technology that I think is uh, has really the potential to empower individuals in a way that uh, technology has not been able to in uh, in general, I would say, over the last 50 years, uh, contrasted really sharply with uh, what is a, in my opinion, you know, pretty pervasively authoritarian government and system of governance in China. Um, so I think that, you know, that was kind of the crucible uh, that got me interested in the idea of decentralization and its power to empower individuals and uh, why I sit here before you today in, in 2023. It's a great story and your passion is completely reflected in everything you do. And, and I can see why you have that passion from that story, having the alignment of, of all of your values together, working towards this uh, industry and contributing to this industry. We are very lucky. Yeah, well, again, thank you. You're, you're, you're embarrassing me here. But uh, uh, I had a weird kind of um, back to the future moment because I saw an old textbook from my junior year of high school right after I got back from China and it asked what uh what right i thought was most important that americans enjoy and i said something about uh you know my impression of the ccp after having lived in china and the right i said was the ability to uh, you know engage in free speech without government interference and i think that uh decentralized networks broadly can do that uh with respect to speech but of course you know financial activity is just as important as people's ability to talk. So I think, um, you know, crypto uh, aligns very well with, you know, my personal beliefs in a lot of ways. I think that's a great segue to dig into some of the policy and regulatory challenges that the industry is facing. What are the most significant challenges that we're facing, in your opinion, today? And how is the DeFi Education Fund working to address those challenges? Yeah, I think you know the, I think the the largest hurdle for the crypto industry and even more so the DeFi ecosystems uh, specifically is the real novelty of how the technology solves old problems in new ways, and that how it goes about doing that is so different than how we have solved those problems for the last hundred years. Uh, that it's a, it's a, it necessitates a zeitgeist shift in order to even uh, start grappling with the policy issues. Um, so what I mean by that, uh, to get a little more specific, is uh, you know payments is a perfect example. We use Bitcoin. Uh, the entire financial regulatory regime is predicated on the existence and uh, responsibilities, uh, ability to impose responsibilities on financial intermediaries. And when that uh, is no longer an option, you really uh, have to completely rethink uh, from the ground up how to go about accomplishing policy objectives in peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks or in, in DeFi. And the foreignness of that concept, I think, is uh, rightly terrifying to a lot of regulators and gov governments. I don't mean that, you know, we're, they should be scared because we're coming for them, but just it's, it's so novel and uh, I think presents such a challenge uh, to the system we have in place today, all of which I think is, you know, very healthy to be thinking about. Um, but I think that is, you know, the core challenge here. It's it's really a fundamental shift in how a, uh, in the context of DeFi and payments, a extremely uh, regulated activity is conducted. And uh, given that, it challenges in really fundamental ways the uh, utility of the existing approach to financial regulation and the accomplishment of policy objectives in finance. I think second, uh, I think that crypto, given the concept itself is about decentralization and 
uh, negating the potency of any uh, individual actor as far as the network's operation or system's operation is concerned. That is completely antithetical to the idea of government. <laughs> um, like, there is no bigger, uh, uh, more powerful centralized entity and intermediary in the world than the U.S. government and, uh, you know, followed closely by other governments around the world. And I think uh, that naturally uh, imbues both crypto folks and government folks with a mutual suspicion of, of, of each. So I think that getting over the idea that, um, uh, you know, crypto exists to undermine uh, what many people believe uh, the state is best suited to accomplish. Um, and on, on crypto's side, getting over the idea that engagement with the government at all is a betrayal somehow of the fundamental uh, uh, principles of the ecosystem uh, is, is another hurdle to get over. And then the third is, uh, I think... You know, big challenge we have is 90% of folks that have heard of crypto think of it as such. It's crypto or it's Bitcoin and that's it. Uh, obviously, folks in crypto laugh at the idea that, uh, you know, the uh, really varied um, and uh, vastly different innovations that have come out of this space could all be encapsulated in one concept, crypto. Uh, is you know it's it's a challenge to get people to think about anything beyond um crypto as just a categorical idea and think about the differentiation between uh the bitcoin protocol the zcash protocol uh a centralized exchange versus a decentralized exchange protocol they're like oh you know i think folks are like i just figured out bitcoin and now you guys are coming after me with all of this other all of this other stuff, like, you know, pump the brakes a bit. Um, so I think it's a, it's a daunting uh, uh, technology industry ecosystem to really wrap one's head around. Uh, you know, I we were joking the other day, it would take more than 24 hours a day to just keep up with developments. And um, I think that presents a big challenge because the space moves so quickly and government uh, moves quite slowly. So much of what you just said, I want to dig into deeper and expand upon. There was a ton of good points there. What I like about everything you said is the nuance that you bring to it and the empathy that you have for others who are trying to approach the space and trying to, especially policymakers and regulators, trying to figure out how to regulate it and ensure that consumers are protected, the citizens are, are protected. What's interesting to me is you talked about the fundamental nature of governments as being the centralized entities and other centralized entities that are being disrupted through the introduction of cryptocurrencies and DeFi. But it occurs to me also that governments really shouldn't have that perspective because especially the governments in like our government, the United States government is based on limited powers sure. and enumerated powers. So in theory, <laughs> in theory, that should be consistent yeah. with it. So I hope that we always continue to remember that. No, I completely agree. You know, I think many of the principles that uh, are embodied in the founding documents of uh, the United States as a body politic are reflected in something like the Bitcoin protocol, empowering individuals, you know, giving them the ability to do things uh, on their own. Um, is I think something that is well aligned with uh, what I think to be U.S. values, and I hope we uh, promote them. I hope so too. I I wanted to pick up on another thing you said is that when regulators and policymakers approach the space, they want to try to use prior models mm -hmm. that they, that have worked in other ways. So something that uh, we see is that. Regulators want to try to just address it all to say, okay, we understand what crypto and Bitcoin and all of the DeFi is. We just need to put this into a box mm -hmm. and be done with it. And you wrote a very nice article, a very long title, so I'm going to read it. Here. <laughs> it's It was in um, December 22, Fortune, uh, and it was a kitchen, a, um, excuse me, <clears throat> it was 
A kitchen sink approach won't work if the 118th Congress wants to fix its DeFi problem. And in that article, you emphasize the need for a fit-for-purpose policy approach to DeFi and the importance of not applying the same regulations to centralized and decentralized ex exchanges. How do you suggest Congress and regulatory agencies develop a tailored and effective legislative framework that addresses the unique aspects of DeFi while also promoting innovation and mitigating potential risks? Yeah, I think the hurdle right now is convincing people of the need to come up with a tailored approach. Uh, and we haven't even gotten to the stage of what that approach will look like. I think that, uh, you know, generally kind of the, the flow chart of, I think, policymakers' approach to DeFi begins with the question uh, as to whether decentralization can even exist. Uh, that is not something that everyone is uniformly in agreement uh, on. You know, there are, for example, academics that think uh, miners and validators uh, should be regulated as financial intermediaries and that decentralization, you know, it, as a concept is essentially a red herring. So that's the first, uh, you know, I think um, hurdle to get over. The second is... Uh, particularly in Congress, whether decentralization is a social good or a social ill. Uh, there was a speech given by former uh, CFTC commissioner Dan Berkowitz, who was then SEC general counsel and has since left there uh, in 2020 or 2021, in which he argued that decentralization is a net social ill because of the fact that uh, today, policy objectives in financial services are generally accomplished via the regulation of, of custodial and financial intermediaries. Uh, so I think that's the second question. Uh, you know, in, I think that is certainly a question that is uh, up to Congress to decide and not one for regulators to be uh, opining on, but that is, that is a separate rabbit hole. Um, so, you know, we, we have this first hurdle of whether decentralization is possible, the second hurdle of whether decentralization is a social good. And then, the, uh, you know, if you if you get to step three, which is, I think, generally where folks are right now, is, OK, you know, decentralization is a thing. Uh, it's happening. How does it differ from uh, the centralized intermediaries we, we know and love uh, functionally? Because understanding the functional differences is how uh, you can start thinking about what a tailored approach looks like. Um, so I think that's the stage we're in right now. Uh, I think like a lot of the policy proposals that would be detrimental uh, to the DeFi ecosystem are not intended to be uh, uh, something, you know, proposals that would uh, ban DeFi or apply CeFi regulations to DeFi. I think it's more of a educational issue necessitating, uh, you know, the work of explaining, okay, here's how a decentralized exchange works and the risks that it can present to consumers. Here is how DEX protocol works. And these are the differences. Here's, you know, the fundamental functional differences between these two things. Obviously, it necessitates, you know, a different approach. Simple analogy uh, I like to use is, uh, there's this term, which is kind of my, my pet peeve in, in financial regulation, uh, that or it's more of a, of a saying, which is same, biz same activity, same risks, same rules. Uh, the idea being folks engaged in the same financial activity uh, present the same risks and therefore should be regulated in the same way. I reject that out of hand because of uh, returning to the simple analogy I alluded to. Just because, for example, um, transportation services, cars and airplanes, both get you from point A to point B, the same activity, uh, they certainly don't present the same risks to consumers, and therefore, thank God, we don't regulate them in the same way. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, we should be thankful that just because transportation services are transportation services, we don't regulate them in the same way. Um, importantly, one of those reasons being that if one took that approach to regulation, we would never have innovation of any variety because an airplane would have to uh, 
uh, never exceed a 65 mile an hour speed limit. It's nonsensical. And I think that in the context of financial services, there's never, or at least in recent history, been such a fundamental innovation uh, uh, in how the problem can be solved, meaning uh, software allowing people to engage in economic activities online is is so revolutionary uh, that folks haven't even considered, I think, in in a lot of instances, uh, the idea that you know there could be a car and an airplane in financial in the context of financial services, so to speak. So I think that's kind of the stage we're in right now. Um, you know, showing people how uh, centralized financial intermediaries, be they in, in traditional finance or in crypto markets and DeFi protocols, uh, function in such fundamental different ways. And then explaining why, uh, convincing them, you know, that that necessitates uh, just logically a different approach. Um, so I think that Europe has uh, adopted that approach uh, smartly. You know, they did they did MICA one and are studying DeFi and its implications for the next couple of years, which is exactly what I hope the U.S. is going to be doing, because. Uh, there are a few ideas out there as to what, you know, a, a quote unquote tailored regulatory approach would look like. Um, but there certainly has not been a robust public debate uh, uh, to the point that we are ready to do anything, in my opinion. I really like how you outlined how the old saying about same activity, same risk, same rules doesn't apply in this case. And, and in many cases, it doesn't apply. It is so appealing to think about that because mm -hmm. at a certain level, it, it makes sense, but it depends about what level of granularity you're looking, I suppose, and then how you're looking at the specific technology and the specific approach to accomplishing a, a certain thing. Yeah, you can't just ignore the, how something functions uh, because how something functions is quite material to the risks and opportunities it presents to, to individuals. It certainly is. So everything that you've said so far makes me appreciate the challenge you have in educating policymakers and regulators and others who are interested in learning about this space. And I guess that's why it's in your name, the DeFi Education <laughs> Fund. That makes so much sense. That's a great name for you, for the organization. So um, I'm curious, uh, what strategies do you use to build relationships with policymakers and stakeholders, and how do you go about educating them? Is there any particular way that you're doing that successfully? Yeah, so I, I mean, crypto, I think one great strength we have uh, from a, a policy education uh, perspective is concerned is it's fascinating. Love crypto, hate crypto. Generally, people are absolutely fascinated by it, its concepts the underlying technology. And that makes, I think, our job uh, somewhat easier in that uh, folks are like, whoa, you know, they've heard all about this stuff. What does it actually mean? And as soon as, you know, they, they scratch the surface, I think people generally are uh, fascinated by what, uh, you know, the, the industry is trying to do and the potential of the technology. So I think that is, uh, you know, to our great benefit and something we try to take advantage of. Uh, our approach to education has developed uh, through experience over the last 16, 18 months. And, uh, you know, learn from us when I say demos are the way to go. We uh, have almost uh, started exclusively doing demos during DeFi 101s uh, with policymakers. Uh, because it increases the likelihood of light bulb moments significantly. Uh, seeing is believing, and uh, you know you can talk about all of these things in the abstract, but opening your computer and actually doing them in front of uh, staffers and regulators who are uh, unable to in many situations, unfortunately, is uh, the most effective thing we've ever uh, we've ever done. So uh, I highly recommend demos as, as a way to do education while you're talking through the concepts. And, uh, you know, in practice, that means you know, walking around the hill with your laptop.
That's amazing. You know, you're not the first person that told me that. In fact, I just heard it yesterday when we had a conversation with Lindsay Kelleher, who's a member of the professional staff at the new Digital Assets, Financial Technology and Inclusion subcommittee of the House Financial Services Committee. She was saying the same thing. She says, come in and do demos, show people how it works. That is the most effective way. So, um, okay, I'm, con I'm convinced. Yeah, demos. Yeah, no, it's... Uh... It's almost like so intuitive that I'm embarrassed we didn't think of this, you know, five years ago. Um, but it uh, it really has been a game changer to a large extent. It's a little bit tricky because some of the demos that like we might do, for instance, are a little bit technical and it is maybe not so user friendly. We're sure. Still, so we'll have to work on that. Too. Smooth out the edges, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, for for you know, having some assets in a MetaMask and, and using a DeFi front end uh, is not, uh, is looks relatively intuitive uh, when you have it all teed up. Yeah, it, it does. So that actually is a very nice user interface. And, and I agree, that would be very effective. Also, I appreciate how your organization is so collaborative with others in the ecosystem. Of course, you work closely with the Blockchain Association, but You've also worked recently with some others. Can you tell us about how you collaborate and which groups you're working with most effectively? Yeah, so our uh, collaborative approach, you know, I think just generally uh, our team is a pretty collaborative bunch and um, are pretty mission-oriented in that we want to see the world safe for DeFi. And uh, uh, I think that allows us to uh, be flexible in that uh, we just want to to win, so to speak, uh, and that means uh, you know we're we're an open door to working with folks. It also, I think, uh, well, I know is uh, due to the fact that the governance proposal that uh, really was the origin of this organization uh, in the Uniswap DAO um, was uh, uh, directed the. DeFi Education Fund not to reinvent the wheel and to collaborate with existing organizations uh, because, you know, we, we did not, we're not here to compete with anybody. We're here to uh, supercharge DeFi related advocacy and, and do it ourselves as well. Um, so that uh, uh, is also enabled by our ability to give other organizations grants. So a great example is a group called Fight for the Future, which uh, I think it might be known to the to the crypto crowd from their work in August 2021 when the broker provision of the bipartisan infrastructure framework was was a big issue. Uh, they set up what really ended up being quite a potent grassroots advocacy effort. And um, Fight for the Future is a uh, is an advocacy group focused on protecting individuals' digital rights. Uh, you know, ensuring people can. Uh, uh, live their lives online, which, um, you know, I think is, is increasingly where folks live their lives, certainly where I do, uh, in a way that's privacy respecting, in a way uh, that folks, you know, can retain uh, the protections afforded to individuals uh, in, in meat space, but in, in digital space. Uh, they were really uh, the key advocacy group in the net neutrality battles back in the early 2010s so have been at this for a while and uh the the, the benefits of DeFi protocols self-custody permissionless access uh etc all align quite well with their mission um so we uh support them with grants such that they can focus on DeFi advocacy in addition to everything else they're working on and uh, that's a great way to, I think, you know, leverage the strengths of uh, mission-aligned organizations. And, uh, you know, they'll always do grassroots advocacy better than we would ever be able to. So uh, no need to reinvent the wheel. Crypto, you know, I think the lobby more broadly, um, uh, yeah, crypto folks, I think, are quite passionate uh, about crypto, which is yeah, what, probably my favorite thing about the crypto space. That also means, uh, you know, like families, there's a lot of fighting. And I think that uh, a negative externality of that is sometimes um, 
the industry's approach to policy engagement can be fractured, and that's to our detriment. Uh, so we we do try to uh, act as the glue uh, as much as we can to keep uh, you know the raucous crowd all rowing in the same direction uh, when it comes to DeFi. I appreciate that, and I I really love fight for the future. I'm so glad to hear you're supporting. Yeah, the, they're the an amazing work. organization. Um, I encourage folks to check them out because, uh, you know, whether it's crypto or, uh, you know, encrypted messaging, they've been uh, at the forefront of protecting those online rights for over a decade now. On the topic of self-hosted wallets, can you explain the potential consequences of implementing additional restrictions on self-hosted wallets in terms of financial inclusivity, especially in developing countries? Um, yeah, I think the first, like the most important concept to understand about self-custody is no self-custody, no crypto. There's nothing innovative about a uh, blockchain network if people cannot self-custody the assets being uh, tracked on that ledger. You get back to a system that's completely intermediated and the core uh, benefits of the innovation are eliminated. So, you know, no self-custody, no crypto, I think is certainly a, a top of mind, uh, uh, you know, is a, is a threshold issue to consider here. From, you know, I think a, a policymaker's perspective, one has to think about um, people's ability to transact and uh, it transact privately and uh, on their own accord in the context of other rights. I think Coin Center has done uh, a better job than anyone explaining why people's ability to freely transact and to transact privately is foundational to protecting individual liberty and uh, uh, building a democratic society that respects people's rights. Um, you know, I think that in the context of the world as it as it exists today, there is uh, fewer and fewer options uh, outside of crypto to engage in commerce without the involvement of third party intermediaries. Uh, cash is cash usage is declining uh, precipitously. Uh, yeah, I would say that certain governments are openly hostile to cash usage because it isn't intermediated and therefore surveillable. And uh, a world without cash um, or cash-like option online is a world in which uh, a government or others, you know, businesses, etc., could have really perfect surveillance into into people's lives in a way that I think is unacceptable and we need to avoid. Uh, so, for example, you know, it's it's nobody's business um, whether someone is traveling from one state to another in order to receive medical care. Uh, I don't think that uh, anyone has a a uh, urgent need to understand where everyone's uh, money is being spent. One big pushback we get on this uh, is the idea that if you're not doing anything wrong, what do you have to hide? And uh, you know, I think that <laughs> at like the most surface level, I suppose that makes sense, but isn't how humans operate. You know, One perfect example is why do people close their blinds at night? Uh, why do people... Uh, uh, have a shower curtain. You know, there's something about uh, being watched by others that doesn't allow us to be ourselves. And I think that that uh, ability is is important to protect uh, just from, a, you know, a, a, uh, the, the perspective of trying to advance human flourishing and happiness. So I think that's kind of like the more philosophical um, uh, uh foundation of why I think, you know, protecting people's ability to transact uh, uh, whenever, however they want and privately is important. And as I think the uh, usage of cash diminishes and uh, intermediated financial services becomes increasingly uh, non-private, uh, self-hosted wallets and crypto by extension 
uh, becomes all the more important. Uh, and I think the the core concept is that cash is so important for whatever reason cash usage is declining. We need to retain a cash-like option in order to protect people's uh, right to be themselves at the individual level and protection from coercive government action or coercive corporate action at uh, a more societal level. And uh, you know, those those principles are uh, embodied by the tech that uh, crypto is trying to build. And to my knowledge, there's uh, you know, a few other ideas out there about how to do that. You know, there was an act called the eCash Act. That's a, there's, I do think, like uh, a wide group of individuals that agree with the premise that retaining a cash-like option in the digital world is important to re- protecting individual rights. Um, crypto is one way to go about doing that. Uh, without self-hosted wallets, crypto cannot do that. And uh, therefore, it's it's uh, absolutely critical that we protect people's ability to use them uh, without interference. And to your second question, or the second part of your question, I appreciate this is a long rambling answer here. Um, if folks can't access wallets on a permissionless basis, you're back to where we started, which is a financial system that serves uh, 2 billion people in a world uh, of 7 billion people and a world in which already 1 billion people have access to the internet, but not financial services uh, because you are re inserting the need for some gatekeeper to grant individuals access that for you know, a variety of reasons are unable to do so today have been unable to do so for decades and uh it you know, kind of like the internet has i think democratized access to information and knowledge in a really potent way in a way that i don't think anyone understands the implications of yet uh crypto can do the same and i think uh, you know, the ability to access the internet and not only have access to such a vast wealth of knowledge, but also have access uh, to the the ability to engage in the global economic uh, system is uh, something we should we should all be at least in theory supportive of. Of course, people are going to have different ideas about how to go about doing that. That was an incredibly comprehensive answer. It's Thank a long you one. so much it's a long for one. that. It was so good. Love the way you emphasize that privacy is normal. Yes, that yes. Is, that is what we say in Electric Coin Company, and it is. Privacy is something that people should be able to have. It's just part of life that you would have an expectation of. And I love the way you focused on how it is critical also for financial inclusivity and for an, for giving people access to the financial ecosystem, so many of those people who don't have it today and how that could be a potential. It may not be that case today. Sure. Yeah. But we certainly can envision a future. Where right. Exactly. You know, we can all agree that a billion people or like five billion people not having access to the financial system that we that we know and love is a problem. Um, I view crypto as the best extant potential solution to that problem. And uh, that is why, you know, one of the reasons I am a big proponent. It also is, I think, uh, for the same reason, I I think all of this is, is absolutely inevitable, uh, whether or not uh, policymakers here in D.C. want it to be. Uh, it fills a vacuum that is one of the primary inhibitors to wealth creation in vast uh, swaths of humanity and that vacuum will be filled one way or another and i think you know permissionless uh financial infrastructure that people can access with an internet connection is uh the most likely thing to fill that vacuum i don't think we've started to dig into very specific policy proposals Mm -hmm. draft legislation or things that are currently moving. Is there anything out there that is giving you some hope or that you think that we should be looking at and watching closely right now? Sure. Yeah. The top of mind items for uh, us as an organization right now in the U.S. are 
you know, it's easiest to think about these things in uh, the buckets of uh, branches of government, or at least that's how I think about it. So let's start with Congress. Uh, you know, I think that um, right now our our operating assumption is that uh, legislation this Congress is unlikely on uh, anything that would be uh, super DeFi relevant. Um, I think the the same is true for crypto more broadly, with with a couple exceptions. Um, I don't think that is uh, due to a lack of desire to get something done. I think it's due to uh, what is right now. Uh, I think the most vocal policymakers, most active policymakers on crypto and DeFi issues, uh, are those who are most apart on the uh solutions can uh uh spectrum so the folks i'm thinking of here are senators warren and brown on the one end of the spectrum uh you know who i think that uh to a large extent think crypto should be banned and then uh on the other end of the spectrum folks like patrick mahenry and and uh representative emmer who i think view this space as uh one that has a lot of potential to do a lot of good I don't know where the Overton window of those two groups overlaps to the extent it does. And I think that uh, that dynamic is going to make it quite difficult to get legislation past this Congress. That being said, I do expect it to be the most active Congress on crypto issues. I think there's going to be you know, more bills introduced than ever before, probably more hearings on crypto issues than ever before. Um, so want to make sure that... Uh, you know, those proposals are uh, reflective of that, uh, you know, threshold uh, uh, issue I was discussing earlier, the functional differences between CFI and DeFi uh, and are responsive to those in, in some coherent way. Because Congress, you know, 99% of bills don't pass, but what ends up becoming law, uh, I do think, uh, you know, collates a lot of unpassed bills almost like a common law system to create the law um so it's important to make sure that uh you know crypto relevant bills are are good for DeFi because uh yeah something will happen eventually it'll probably be some amalgamation of other bills thrown together and, and then passed and you don't want to uh, be stuck in the situation where you're like oh i thought i didn't care about that bill because it was never going to pass and you know here it is on the omnibus and uh now you've got to go crazy. So that is kind of my view on you know, how Congress is going to go. I do think that, you know, if Congress does anything, uh, uh, Ch uh, Chairman McHenry was t discussing this yesterday. It'll be on um, some markets bill um, with uh, that addresses the the million dollar question of SEC for CFTC issues or dollar stablecoin legislation, which in my opinion is is the most ripe and uh, I hope Congress acts on, although um, it seems like you know, some of that momentum has been lost uh, versus last August when that was uh, rumored to be happening last time. Um, in the executive branch, there are, I think, a few things uh, that, that DeFi folks should keep top of mind. The first is an SEC rulemaking from January of 2022, uh, uh, the ATS exchange rulemaking. Um, this uh, proposed rulemaking for uh, DeFi's uh, purposes is important because it expands the SEC's interpretation of what an exchange is uh, in a way that could capture uh, protocols themselves, uh, uh, websites that write ma messages for wallets and that are then sent to protocols um, in a way that rejects any uh, concept or any idea that CFI and DeFi operate in different ways. Uh, so kind of unpacking that uh, probably uh, illog <laughs> I mean, gibberish or French sentence to folks who are not policy nerds. Um, Congress passes the laws in this instance, passed a law in 1934 that defined what a, a securities exchange is. It has a definition in there in the statute. Uh, it says, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, that is an exchange under the 
uh, Securities Act and uh, SEC uh, have at it. The SEC then interprets that definition and updates its interpretations of that definition over time. And that is what is at issue here. It's not changing the statutory definition. The SEC is proposing to change its uh, regulatory interpret in, uh, definition that interprets the statutory definition. Uh, why it is problematic is the concept of exchange as envisioned in uh, the 34 Act and in the entire uh, securities, securities regulatory regime is something like the New York Stock Exchange. A custodial stock exchange where people, you know, get together and uh, trade securities. In the 34 Act definition, it literally talks about the physical premises. Like they're thinking about a building, you know, down on on Wall Street in, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, the SEC is proposing to expand that definition to include, quote unquote, persons who make available communication protocol systems. They don't define what a communication protocol system is, uh, but any communication protocol system that allows a, or that could allow an individual to express interest in trading a security could be captured by the definition. Uh, infinitely ambiguous, infinitely broad. A footnote in the 650-page rulemaking itself uh, helpfully exempted cell phones from this definition, uh, which, you know, I think evidences on the one hand, uh, the definition's limitless reach and, uh, on the, you know, on the other hand, the illogical, uh, approach that the, the rulemaking is taking that I, you know, I think is in a lot of ways the rejection of the concept of the rule of law. If you have to exempt cell phones from, the definition of a national securities exchange, something's gone very, very wrong. Um, for DeFi's purposes, you know, nobody knows what a communication protocol system is. The uh, That's a completely novel term. The only other place we've seen that term is actually in a bill that Senator Warren introduced last year, uh, which, yeah, I don't I don't know the uh, the uh, meaning to be drawn from that. But um, a DeFi protocol allows people to express a uh, non-firm interest in trading what the SEC might consider to be securities. And then it says uh, that protocol needs to comply with the exact same regulations that the New York Stock Exchange uh, is, is subject to. Again, completely illogical from uh, <laughs> a number of perspectives and... Uh, we submitted two comments. I don't know whether the SEC is going to move forward with the with the that rulemaking. The ball's in their court. Uh, they have to consider comments, uh, but could uh, you know drop it this afternoon, I suppose, or or next next Wednesday because they have to notice uh, a week out. Um, so I don't uh, you know the prospects of that rulemaking being finalized is is anyone's guess. Um, you know, I don't think it's a top, top priority for the SEC because it's not as, uh, politically charged as other rulemakings they're attempting to get over the finish line right now. Um, so I, I assume they have other higher priorities, but that is all, uh, you yeah, know, armchair speculation. Um, the second rulemaking is one that doesn't exist yet, but could uh, 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 exist in the near future, which is uh, related to the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Framework's uh, uh, new definition of broker for IRS reporting purposes. Um, that you know definition became law, and Treasury uh, has been for a couple of years now uh, talking about issuing a rulemaking to, uh, similarly to the exchange definition, interpret what uh, this new definition of broker actually means, uh, who's actually subject to its uh, uh, reporting requirements, etc. Um, the the concept here um, is probably pretty familiar to folks. Uh, you know, when you use a traditional broker like Charles Schwab or E Trade, at the end of the year, you get your 1099k. It says, here's what you bought, 
here's your cost basis. You lost this amount of money or you made this amount of money. And therefore, here's your tax obligation. They send that to you, the customer, and they also send that to the IRS, uh, similar to you know the W-2 system. And the IRS can cross-reference those numbers and uh, they are, it improves tax enforcement. So in the context of crypto, you know, folks uh, like businesses like uh, Coinbase custodial exchanges have been trying to figure out how to do 1099-like reporting for many, many years. Um, so, you know, they all uh, are, are certainly going to be captured by the definition. And uh, I don't think anyone objects to, the, to, the, to that. They, of course, want to provide their customers with uh, some easy way to figure out their tax obligations. Where it becomes tricky is, okay, uh, what happens if the, uh, you know, this potential rulemaking says something to the effect of a DeFi protocol as a broker for IRS reporting purposes? Um, uh, it, one cannot apply regulatory obligations to software. And so what that means in practice is anyone's guess and uh, waiting with bated breath for, for that rulemaking to come out. Again, this is not an actually a live issue. You know, crypto policy folks like to stress about things that haven't happened. Uh, not that we don't have enough to worry about that has happened. Um, so this is, again, all speculation, but I do think uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Um, those are the major ones. There's uh, a more niche, you know, dealer rulemaking over at the SEC as well. Um, uh, but those are the ones that, that I would keep an eye on uh, at the moment. Uh, which brings us to our third branch of government, the judiciary. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot going on there. You know, there are um, patent trolls suing DAOs, uh, which is, I think, uh, certainly something one wants to keep an eye on. I think, you know, overall DAOs are and I th a, a tricky spot right now because um, they are getting and will continue to be getting sued. And uh, it's unclear who has the ability or uh, the desire to defend them in uh, judicial proceedings. And so you end up with default judgments, which is why we got involved in uh, the Uki Dao case, which uh, was not a patent troll, but the... Uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission bringing a case against a DAO. So I think right now, of of like all of the uh, branches of government, it's uh, the most active is uh, uh, the judiciary, um, because you know private plaintiffs, public plaintiffs are bringing these cases and they're working themselves through the courts. Uh, so the cases I you know I think are, that are top of mind for DeFi specifically are these. Uh, True return system, this uh, patent troll versus maker DAO, compound DAO, couple class actions uh, against DAOs, um, CSTC versus Uki, the class action versus B, uh, BZX, which was the developer of the Uki DAO protocol. Um, on the you know more broad broader uh, policy questions, the Tornado Cash cases are definitely. Uh, uh, to that we're following closely, whether the you know, uh, Treasury's uh, designation of a software protocol as a uh, sanctioned entity, uh, you know, purported entity, is uh, legal, possible, uh, desirable within their, uh, within their statutory authority, etc. Uh, one kind of like sleeper case that I think is quite interesting um, is uh, Harper versus Rettig. Uh, this is a case in which the plaintiff Harper uh, was a Coinbase customer and uh, Coinbase received from the IRS what's called a John Doe uh, subpoena, which says you know, any one of your customers that fits uh, these archetypal characteristics, you need to uh, give us their personal information. Um, this uh, uh, plaintiff is suing uh, the IRS, Commissioner Reddick, uh, in his position as, as uh, the head of the IRS over that summons. And it's bringing up um, you know, pretty fundamental questions about uh, the Fourth Amendment, the third party doctrine, and questions that I uh, think 
you know, are, are definitely pertinent to crypto policy discussions, but I think uh, probably even uh, more more so interesting to folks in crypto from just an intellectual societal perspective. Uh, what are other cases? I mean, there are so many, so <laughs> there's there's a lot going on, but I think, yeah, all, all the DeFi cases, uh, the Tornado Cash cases, certainly worth keeping an eye on. And um, uh, this Harper versus Reddick, I feel like is kind of a sleeper that, that folks should take a look at. Miller, I am truly astounded by the comprehensiveness with which you answered that question. And, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And your knowledge. And I just, I think our, our viewers and our audience is going to get such a treat and such an education. From, I hope so. From yes, watching that's this. Very, it's my job, so I hope it's uh, going okay. <laughs> You're doing it exceptionally, exceptionally well. Well, thank you, Val. I appreciate that. Well, with that, we've covered a ton. I know you have to get back to your work. It was a snap. It was keep quick. moving things forward. We could go another eight hours here. <laughs> we could. I don't know if I could, but I'm sure you could. Thank you so much for of being course, with my us pleasure. on the PGP for Crypto podcast. Thank you.